ile kazi ambayo tunafanya Nairobi kuna watu ambao wanataka tupoteze focus hatutapoteza focus we know what needs to be done we know the progress we are making so usisikie uchungu unajua hata mimi nasikia uchungu nikiona wewe ukipigwa na tunaomba yeye atupatie 22.5% or whatever he has put in his pockets ama tena nimesema vibaya nikiomba hiyo nimesema vibaya as countries embrace rapid digitalization of economic activities in e-commerce and employment the demand for labor in the digital economy necessitates the need to devise new strategies in governance and policy framework for fair distribution of gains and opportunities na waketi chini minimum wage tuongeze at least minimum by 6% na mtaniambia vile hesabu hiyo itafanyika alafu pale mbele tutaongea na nyinyi vile mambo itakavyo kwenda mbele as we commemorate labor day let us we dedicate ourselves to doing our best and contributing our utmost to enhance the welfare of every Kenyan. Labour gloomers, Ruto dashes pay rise hopes as uh, you can see it in today's uh, Standard Workers Day despite a spirited push for a 22.5% salary hike employees walked away with little to smile about. The expectations of a big increase to counter the high cost of living dashed even as the president promised only six percent raise with implementation left to labor cs six seven and eight is where the story is well fleshed out for you in today's publication you can read all about it also brutal farm on taxes intern doctors pay is on the front page of the daily nation as well good news as president ordered six percent minimum wage increase for workers this was all about labor day yesterday uh, Ruto Grand 6% raise reject court to demands. That's a splash on the front page of the star. And die is cast for CS Linturi in removal war. A different kettle of fish as far as the headline is concerned on the front page of the People Daily. And Atas Akayo Nijina. Atas Akayo Nijina is what is on the front page of Taifa Leo. Right, let's begin with Atas Akayo Nijina. Yesterday, of course, is all about taxation, 6%. <laughs> we can talk about it, Patrick Obath. What do you think about uh, yesterday? And the six percent increment, uh, inflation is also paring down a bit, but still, it seems when you do your calculation, uh, what will work away is only a percenter of increase. So, we're talking about two thousand shillings. Uh, will that really make any discernible difference? <coughs> I, I think what for me, the president did the right thing, um, he did not get carried away in the moment and the demands of the moment and issue an edict which is not based on a proper study. This 1st of May expectation of an increase in wages, I think is the wrong thing. Wages should be increased when the economy demands that wages should go up. And it could be possible that with changes that are happening in an economy, wages need to go up twice in a year, minimum wages, mm. because the indicators are that that's what should happen. And therefore, the wages should not be targeted on the 1st of May. They should be targeted when the indicators in the economy show that a worker or anybody, an employee, let me just say a worker, any employee in the country is being disadvantaged by the economic circumstances surrounding them. And the only way that can work, and this I've seen in other countries around the world, is by having a proper I don't, I don't want to call it a wages council, but a remuneration team, like mm. the SRC. Mm -hmm. But they sit, and we've got this tripartite agreement between the, the, you know, the unions, uh, the, the, the employers, and the Ministry of Labor, right? That should <coughs> form the basis of a proper economic council that sits down, looks at the growth of the economy, because any wage increment has to be funded from somewhere. Absolutely. And the best Absolutely. way of looking at how to fund it is showing the growth in the economy. Because if the wage increment is bigger than the growth in the economy, then it means that people will lose their jobs somewhere uh -huh. in order for that increment to be, to be met, right? Uh -huh. So, in a way, I think the president has said the right thing, that let's, the people who are supposed to discuss that, which is the tripartite team, the, labor, the, labor, the, the, the Ministry of Labor, 
the trade unions and the uh, Federation of Employers sit down and come out with something that reflects the reality of the economy in the country. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I expect that they should do that in a, in a speedy manner because this should be a council that works all the time. They should not just be working towards the 1st of May. Mm -hmm. The 1st of May is, a, is to celebrate the workers. Mm -hmm. That's what the intention of the 1st of, of May is. It's a day across the whole world to celebrate workers. And that's all you should do. This issue of thumping around and talking about wages should be something that is done in a tripartite meeting behind the scenes. But uh, for me, I think that has been the precedent that uh, has been set. The precedent uh, has been set. It's a political thing. It's I mean, now, political. It's, now it's basically you go there, you thump the table and you say, President, this, or so and so, this, I am this, I am that and the other. And uh, poor Jackie from FKE comes in there and talks about you know, the private sector can't afford it. And, you know, it's a circus for me. That's so, the whole thing. We right. need a structured way of doing it rather than, you know, this tradition that has been there that the 1st of May expect our pricing. Uh, a wage no, they were not seeing eye to eye with uh, Jacqueline Mugo also and, uh, as far as the minimum wage is, is concerned and yeah. the law. <coughs> that there should be a law. Uh, and this is where the handshake uh, or the Nikikusalimia, that is law, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. do you think... We need that particular threshold uh, of the law of the, is the, there. The law is there. The law, the Wages Council, is actually enacted in the 2007, um, the, the labor laws of 2007. Mm -hmm. The Wages Council is there, and the co and the constitution of the Wages Council is very clear. The only problem is that the Labor Minister has not appointed the labor, the, the Wages Council and told them to go on with their work. That is all that needs to be done. So the law is there. It's not around. The, you know, the president said, "Go back." And discuss it with the committee because he that's knows. a council you're talking yeah. about mm -hmm. he knows that there is that that, 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 that labor that, that wages council so i think like as always happened i think um, my good friend uh, atoli is just dodging the issue he wants to be the one to sort of um, to be the one who has made the decision on behalf of the country by asking <laughs> the president to do something and that is i mean th that has played in year in year out and it plays in every year but ideally, the wages council should be the guide that sets what, the, what is, you know, the, the wage increment. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, it can happen any time in the year, <coughs> so long okay. as the indicators say it should happen. Mm -hmm. It can be announced in October. Right. And, and, and I think that's our you're from, saying, yeah. You're saying that, you know, wafanyikazi uh, wapewe pesa. Hata ile hiko kumfuko, kumfuko yako. In a very nuanced way, what was he saying? I think there is interesting in the sense that... Uh, yeah. Uh, probably not being a bit harsh. You have to distinguish some rhetorics. Yeah. You know, and uh, if you are singing the same song for almost 22 years, probably we have little to offer. But I think that as a president, if I was in the position of the president, I probably would not be giving the statement, go back and work it. Mm. It is, should have been worked, and the, pro the president says, it's this, we are going this way. So I think if they probably put the president in a difficult position, uh, from my perspective, the homework should have been done. I think the president should not be a person, particularly like yesterday, telling people to work. And, 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 and uh, he's spot on. And I was like, what are the parameters which drives the minimum wage bill? Why 22%? Why not 10? Why not 30? That homework needs to be done. One of the key factors is the inflation. And more importantly, the productivity. If you tell my brother that he, uh, my new wage is uh, 20,000 or whatever, and they are not producing, where do I get it from? Mm -hmm. So that narrative, that homework has to be done. And the president is briefed very clearly. These are what we can afford because the economy is performing this much. So, uh, <coughs> and I think our, uh, Atwoli has been there for some time. I think he need to think back. 22 years, somebody has gone to colleges working, you know, co the corporate world, you say, if you have done 10 years as CEO, move on. Uh, I think it's time he stepped back. Let's get his wisdom and uh, uh, provide the uh, young tax I in this. And uh, as uh, pointed out by Jackie, it's a very interesting when you find, I think it's a level of lack of decorum. I cannot be fighting you at the podium. Mm -hmm. Because we have said something and I'm fighting <coughs> on the podium, I think some respect, a level of respect need to be in play. But the bottom line, let's have a, a way of really looking at reasonable or what I would call objective way of the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right.
the ball for me starting with Zakayo. Zakayo for me is a very solemn name. My best boyfriend until he passed on was nicknamed Zakayo. Banker uh, Joseph Atamwai Barclays. So Zakayo is a special name. He happened to have been shot. So the president saying, Ata Zakayo Nijina, call me whatever name you want. Uh, I, I think it's, it's not a bad thing. But on the other hand, it's bad that the legacy that he may leave behind was uh, one day, 20 years down the line, what Kenyans may remember him for is the person who tax the most. So it's not a good tax, uh, even though it's being said in uh, uh But that notwithstanding the bell, in terms of Atuli uh, and the labor movement, I think Atuli's predecessor, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, Wafula Samia, a name like that, did a reasonably good job. But I think um, Atuli doesn't present a very good image for the young people in terms of what a leader should be. Because Ladley has been a survivor. Mm -hmm. He knows how to play his games and survives. Does he really serve the interest of the workers? I'm not too sure that he does. The ball, we're having Labor Day celebrations to commemorate uh, workers. Globally, it's called International Workers Day. Um, the US uh, doesn't celebrate it in no. May. Yeah. I think it's in September. Even UK the does first it. The Monday of September. Right. Even UK doesn't do it at the beginning of uh, May. They do it at the end of the the, of May. In our time there, they used to call it bank holiday or something like that. So it's something that's globally observed. But um, uh, ha having said that, the ball <sighs> minimum wage, um, I, I think, as the economists in the house have elaborated, has to be tied onto something. Uh, the fundamentals, even if you gave a, re uh, a rise of whatever, and I agree with the professor. You know, mentioning arbitrary figures, 22, what is it percent or 6 percent? What is right. it based on? And yet we now have big data and artificial intelligence that should determine so that we are evidence-based, data-driven when you make decisions. So that's justifiable. It's what the worker, the employer can afford, but also to give a living wage to the employees. But we're celebrating the Bar Labor Day when our doctors have been on strike for more than a month and we barely address we gloss over that issue. I was, to that extent, a little bit disheartened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bilo Kero, what uh, were your sentiments? Uh, just hearing what, especially the issue of doctors, uh, that will have taken also a big chunk of the discussion sure. yesterday. But, yeah, uh, uh, well, I agree with what my colleagues have said with regards to Labor Day. Um, we should be celebrating their achievements. I, I, I think the matching that we have done for you, I don't think it's really... Uh, celebrating the achievements. On, on other national days, people are given awards. Uh, Mashuja days. And so I thought this is the day when within the labor sector, both the FKE and the unions would recognize uh, or, you know, discuss achievements of, 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 of certain sectors and encourage, you know, something that can motivate um, uh, workers. But I think just reducing it to wage, discussions on wage every year uh, diminishes the, the significance of this day when you look at how it was started historically. Mm -hmm. But um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the pay for, for doctors, I, I, I seem to have a problem with the government really on one thing, that you go into a discussion with, 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 with the unions on CBA, you agree, you sign, then you don't implement it. That, that seems to be the challenge in, in most of the time on these strikes between, uh, uh, by doctors, by teachers. It's always about implementation of right. the CBA right. that has been agreed upon. <coughs> Government must be able to keep their word. And, and, and it's not about lack of resources, really. If the government, if you go through printed estimates and look at how four and a half trillion budget is spent, you cannot miss money to pay this uh, few um, in terms I mean, uh, that's not really, it, it, it's, it's not really about lack of money. It's about government, you know, transigence that they've taken a position and, you know, we don't want to move from our position. Uh, we don't have money. Um, and, and now you'll have money when there's something else. So I, I, I think government must respect that medical uh, workers provide a very important uh, 
service. In particular, one of the flagship activities <coughs> of this government, they said, is to provide universal health care. Right. This is it's not about buildings and equipments. It's people. If you don't have the people, if they're not sufficiently motivated, if you consider right. them to be crooks and you send police to go and beat them up, I, I don't think that is the way to handle uh, this. I think government needs to sit down seriously with, with, with labor unions. With this matters. They need to sit down and discuss things. But if you rubbish things and you simply wave away, it has happened before. They won't strike for over 100 days. Now it's closing. It's, it's almost going to another 100 days. Um, we can't have this kind. People are suffering. Patients are suffering. The money is meant to assist the people. Government is there to provide service to people. People are not getting medical services in the rural areas. People can't go to private hospitals. NHIF is not able to service uh, their private sector hospitals, so most of them are not even providing um, NHIF, whatever. So people are really suffering in the rural areas. Government is there to provide service. And to the extent that they are not able to get service in a hospital is a fail of the government. I think that's the larger picture they need to look at. It's not about a fight between doctors and who is going to be stronger. Uh, let them do what they want. <coughs> I think that that's, that's a wrong approach. And but the government, the the government think, said that, uh, the that, you know, towards the end, when this CBA was being uh, signed, it was just in a tearing rush to make sure that to pacify the doctors, this was under Uru Kenyatta's regime, uh, it was towards the tail end, it was not given much consideration. And so, so, so they're not really able to implement this, which is unrealistic. I mean, that is a stock excuse you've heard them really talking about. That's the excuse that, that, that by the government. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's excuse an by excuse. The government. It's not right. Right. A CBA is negotiated over a period of time and it can mm. be signed at any period. Mm. It can be the day before elections, it can be two days after elections. Mm. That is when it is right to sign it. Right? I can choose to say, I'm ready now, let me sign it immediately. Mm. Instead of waiting for the elections so that it is done. Because I've been the one who has been negotiating. Or I can say, let's leave it to the next team. And then the, my counterparts will say, no, 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 no. But with the next team, it's going to start a whole new journey. Let's do it now. <coughs> that thing had been in negotiation for some time. I, I, I have a serious problem because of the word intern. I think that is where there is almost um, blinkers mm. in that place. The word intern started with the doctors years ago. Right? Before it came into the public domain. The word intern was used for doctors who are starting their lives as now Medical doctors practice. in hospital. Mm -hmm. It's very so different from the interpretation of intern. It's the different interpretation. Very and the intern absolutely. doctor is the one who does 90% of the work. It's a qualified work. medical doctor. Mm. That is yeah. a person it's who's a actually looking after, yes. after patients in the ward. Mm. The other doctors who have been there for some time tend to become consultants who come in to deal with specific cases. He's a qualified medical yeah? People think he's still so a student. So that guy mm. is a fully no, qualified a medical qualified, doctor yeah. That's a, doing that their job mis mis and they have been in that place. Mm. So it is not paying an intern. An intern is the period they are serving at the start of their, mm. of their career. Absolutely. Right? And in any world, anywhere in the world, the intern is probably the most worked person. They do most of the work in terms of gaining that experience very rapidly at the beginning. Mm. So they tend to be paid like any person starting on their journey in employment. It is not that person who has finished university and is looking for a job. And I think that has to be the recognition given to that word before they start saying, no, pay this guy 20,000 shillings instead of 200,000. And I think there is a word they use, yeah. residency, as opposed to the intern. Residency and intern is, is another. Yeah. 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 Residency is when you're in the process. Yeah. But when you're in turn, you're actually you're a doctor. You're a doctor. You're a medical but doctor. the point yeah. which we need to do here, and I think it's important, CBA should not be seen as something worked by the party of the day. It's a government thing. And government is not parties. Mm -hmm. It yeah. should transcend what a, because it could have another political party in the next five years. Will they start saying it's the other political party? <coughs> and I think we need to see it from that perspective. Yeah. That is a government which goes with the CBA and not the political parties. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's so sad, and, and Bill, you are spot on. They see what's happening in the economy. Mm -hmm. This is the extravagance we're having. Mm -hmm. Right? And the sad thing is, as we sit here and they sit there, the people who are perhaps in these difficult positions are those who cannot priv uh, manage private sector. Uh, I'm always wondering that I have two members of parliament, former two members of parliament here. Mm -hmm. I, I really wonder how you did you used to do your CBA. You know, they wake up and they make wrong 
they have got it they, they are increment yeah, i'm looking at shame and i'm oh, looking oh. at the bill there, there are differences <laughs> there are differences at the bar uh, maybe i was in the eighth parliament at our time yeah. my salary i think was 10 or 30000 shillings a month so we were true watumishi wauma really i could barely even the only instance that I had trouble paying fees for my children was when I was in parliament. Many would be surprised to know that. So the bail in our time, it was more service. But having said that, the bail, in terms of the CBA, uh, my take is that um, it, it's something that if there is goodwill, it, it's not cast in stone, could always be relooked at. But I fully agree with my colleagues. When on the one hand, you're talking of increasing salaries, for CSS, positions right. that I'm not even sure we need. MPs also angling to increase their own salaries. And the opulence and the wastage that we see in the public sector. The cleaning of the cab roads and the windows at KICC at 38 I know, million shillings. I know, I know, the bar. This is such an essential service that is being provided by the professionals. But I would even extend it further, the bar. It's not only for the interns, the medical, even the teachers, I think teachers are paid, is it 17,000 shillings minimum or something? The and ECDs, ECDs, ECDs yeah, yeah, or the, is it the SS or something? The junior secondary? The junior, the junior secondary. And the ball, you really ask, uh, the interns. are we being fine? Because these are, the, these, are the, these are our manufacturers of human knowledge and human skill. Do, are we getting our priorities right? If you contrast that with MPs that are being paid a million shillings, perhaps, that's the official figures, not to mention the other parts, the loans and so on and so forth. We are not being fair. It's not me. just ECD. You go up to the university, right? And there's a don seated here. I know. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> peanuts. For, fortunately, it's not just yes. peanuts. You know, one time I came back to the right. university and they're sure. like, "Is this my pay slip?" <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, have, yeah, was like, yeah, Dr. No, Obong no, here was no, always no. coining that word, the pecuniary embarrassment. The, <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 yes, yes, you don't call it peanuts, it is pecuniary <laughs> embarrassment. <laughs> you know, the, and what are the number of um, this medical interns? Well, the total number of medical doctors who are unemployed in the country are about 4,000. This is what we were told. Sure. Uh, and the government says we can only afford about 5 billion if they paid 70,000 shillings. This guy is asking for just three times that amount. 15 billion. The go this government is not unable to get 15 billion a year to get doctors to start running hospitals so that everyone in the country gets medical service. Right. I mean, that, that's really... And it's a devolved function, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And, and it's a great, yeah. And that's the bigger picture. 15 billion. Today, they, they have announced we are reducing our budget by nearly yeah. 300 billion, which means the areas where they can cut if they want yeah, tomorrow yeah, exactly to save that that's what's awarded to us yeah. Yeah. so the, they can really consider they can if they want in addition we've seen it was 350 when he mm. made the pronouncement i think he was meeting the dias diasporas right mm. was it in zimbabwe yes mm. where he said it will be 300 of they're looking forward that's right so we can see the figure is now 275 and, uh, billion and, shillings and the ball you know if government even said we may not be able to treble it but we are offering to double it you know it would be at least a starting point of goodwill but you know when a cs comes up and says no we're going to move all government officers so such hard talk yeah. from permanent and pensionable to With contracts yeah. you know you're, you're like adding insult to injury mm -hmm. i think for me that's really the way the government's handling this matter you can't for professionals who are global employees you know they could work anywhere in earth you mm -hmm. don't talk to them like you talk to I don't want to use the other word. Right. Okay. And, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a lack of money. If you go to Business Nation on 20, page 24, mm -hmm. and you look what is in the Business Day on page 1, <coughs> this Kenya Rural Whatever Authority. The it has, Yeah. Two 270 point, word billion. Yeah? Two and one billion I do cash. Since tw 2001? Yeah. Well, this is I, a bounce yeah, which actually yes. should have actually be generating a lot of for this country. Right. And it's idle. Yes, yeah, indeed. Uh, in, in banks, um, you can read also the year there. Just put yeah, that yeah. 201 billion in a fixed deposit in a bank. How I much do you get? That's you what I'm saying. Enough to pay interest, them. Yeah. In, in, enough to pay these doctors. These yeah, then you get a headline. Like, Benz, you know, banks, <laughs> pension funds blocked. 
Yeah, we, we shall so, come to that as well. There's <laughs> <laughs> a contradiction here, you don't understand. Yeah, maybe maybe yeah. Kenyans are waking up to and they're, they're seeing uh, higher stuff on permanent terms. Mseveni, maybe right. they think he's Mseveni directing Korea. Uh, you bet. <laughs> but is, this is in Uganda. <laughs> where they are. So the in Uganda, you know, they're saying higher you know on that permanent stuff. That thing is very confusing. Daily monitor, it could be like daily nation. Yes. You feel it's like here. You know? <laughs> it's, a daily, it's a daily nation. Of, yeah? The it's publication a daily of a daily nation, of course, they yeah. Uh, the national media, media group in Uganda, Uganda. Yeah. 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 but still, it, it brings that particular question talking about uh, on that particular debate of uh, hiring staff. the hiring staff right. on uh, the civil Contract. servants, right? On permanent basis, right? Or on contractual basis at the end of the day, uh, do you think uh, you, you know that is informed the issue uh, of contract or otherwise has to start from the work of the Public Service Commission? and the SRC together. They've got to define how are they going to motivate workers or employees in the government. What's the best way and the most efficient way of holding them in government? Does the government want full flexibility so they can hire and fire as they want? Which politically sounds, sounds very good because I can remove all my people all the people from the previous government and bring my own people in, right? <laughs> so contract terms expired. <laughs> really works that way, yeah? So it gives full flexibility and it's dangerous to have that freedom. So that you're yeah? not a woodwork Especially fixture. given yeah. the political mm. environment that we have in this country. So the SRC and the Public Service Commission, the Teacher Service Commission and all these um, <coughs> state employment agencies must sit down and decide how do we want to ensure that we have the best people working in our organizations. Mm. Whether they're teachers, mm. whether they're you know, civil servants, or whatever, mm. medics, what have you, all those people. What's there? And once you've done that, then you have the appropriate um, instrument mm -hmm. for keeping them there, motivating them, and ensuring that the long term is taken care of. Contracts do not take care of the long term. Mm. They take care of the now. It gives you full flexibility. And a lot of companies have got a mix. Right. You have your core that's staff. It. That's right. it. Your core staff are on permanent and pensionable terms. Then you have what you call the topping up and whatever it is when you've got uh, changes in, in, the, in the requirement. <coughs> those people are on contract. So that when you don't need them, they can go. I mean, they, and, and when you need them, they're back. Like in the tea industry. Right? And in other in industries. I don't keep people to harvest my maize for the whole year. I bring them in when I want. But there are people who are going to look after my maize field or my farm for the whole year. Maybe, maybe those people I I employ them on a long term basis. Right. And when I'm harvesting or doing the initial plowing and everything else, I bring people in. So it's got to be a very clearly defined policy in government, not to just to sit up and say we are putting everybody on contract. Why? So they, they should do it uh, selectively because there has, it, it has been debate about yeah, also the, right. the the commissions if they could do it. Uh, on time. on contract contractual basis, permanent or part time basis, right. at the end of the day, <coughs> commissions. Well, yeah, some of the commissions. I think you should mm. start. But you, 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 you should do so partake leading my notes and. Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't have my glasses on, bro. I mean, I Actually, he's right. I because there are part. certain cadre who are not flexible. Right. You know, if you look at somebody like uh, in government, I'm looking at somebody like a mechanic or a driver. The flexibility of being there to another one, you can. Yeah. But there are people at certain levels who they have opportunities to change their, their program. Mm. So you can do a both. And I, I have gone through that. When he ha I was in Vision 2030, uh, good times at Kibaki regime, the top level directors were on contract. But it's other people that were on permanent basis. And it was driven by that. It's easier for me to be mobile in terms of getting opportunities as opposed to these others. So it's perhaps not cut it off, <coughs> permanent or or contract. It's a, it's a mix of both. And you can easily, as he is talking about the public service, can really look at certain kind of, they are group job groups as they call them. And this one we can go on permanent. Because you're also giving them the job security. Yeah. I can wake up out of the university next time I'm in Somali teaching. Yeah. But this is a part of austerity no. measures you're talking about. If you have a, a bloated wage bill, uh, how do we pay it down? Do we take it on a contractual basis? Uh, you get your money, you go sort out yourself, you sort your taxes, you sort your pension, you sort out, as in that is not the responsibility of the government again. Because there has been debate and you've been here on this mm -hmm. table talking about also paring down on the retirement age. Uh, yeah. 
it is all issues to do with money. At the she end said, of no, it's not. I think you have, you have the wrong end of the stick. The, the issue, you know, when the government talks of the wage bill. But this is what they've they, said. They I do not, see. they are holding the wrong end of the stick. The issue mm. is rationalization mm, of public service. The huh? They don't want to address it. Every right. government that has come in. That is always there, but nobody wants to look at it because of political um, expediency. I, 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 but I think right now they are on it because uh, the 130 parastatal oh, well, should the, be... No, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Let's see it when it's done. Yeah, because they've been talking about it yeah, yeah, for donkey years. <laughs> these, are, these are stories. <laughs> so you don't but, have to hear um, stories I, anymore. I think the, the issue, it is very important to have people selling cadres on permanent and Right. And there are a number of reasons. One, you need career development for people to do. You know, in, in a, you cannot just get people in today after three years, they're out. There has to be progression. There has to be career development. There has mm -hmm. to be, mm -hmm. uh, you have to develop skills, a skill set within that ministry, within that department, that other institution. So mm -hmm. that's why certain people are there. And then at professional level, there are people who are given get contracts. Yeah. For Correct. example, I think Correct. in the last, I think, uh, two decades or so after the new constitution, the permanent secretaries are on <coughs> contract, <coughs> isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a certain level of um, people who run institutions are on contract mm -hmm. because they, 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 they are hired at that level, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, for their knowledge and expertise to just come and work for a certain number of years, probably on projects, particularly in government ministries, you find projects which are funded by donors and all. Right. The people right. who are running those things are mostly hired on, uh, on, 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 on contracts, but the, the, the core people who run government ministries. These people are on permanent and pensionable. You need security of tenor. You need people who, you know, <coughs> have loyalty to that institution and run. And this not only in Kenya, it's in many, it's know, it's in many, memory. many countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, memory and all that. So yeah. to say we will, I think that was just trying to, a knee-jerk reaction to, to, to the doctor's strike, uh, which, is, which was misplaced. Mm. Uh, uh, Debal, I fully agree with the aspect of rationalization. And I think uh, Governor Simbarati tried it. Um, recently, I think when he came into office, mm -hmm. I think he found, I don't know how many hundreds, uh, if not thousands of drivers. <laughs> and he called them all to the stadium, the stadium, and then told them, these are all the government vehicles, go stand next to the vehicle <laughs> that you drive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it may have been a crude method, but you know, with the data, those ghost workers, there are um, no, many ways. That is real-time audit. I yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> and in, it works. Life, life. You know? life, life. <laughs> and, and government could do much more of that rationalization. But also I think government needs to, just instead of either the salaries, remuneration commission, or PSE, having arbitrary figures, the gaps, mm. the, wide, the, the wide gap between the lowest paid in government and the highest paid. How do you justify the bar? Mm. There must be reasons why you decide to pay somebody 10,000 shillings and another 100,000 shillings. So that needs to be rationalized. But also, lastly, the bar in terms of President Museveni. Close observers, I think this is not the first time that when Kenya seems to go east, President mm -hmm. Museveni pronounces something that goes west. I have observed that over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of what we did when we were in Rwanda. When I took my job in Rwanda, I actually had an offer also in Zambia, which was about twice more lucrative financially. But I told myself, Rwanda is such as, sorry, Zambia at the time was largely a settled economy, like Kenya. I, don't, I didn't imagine I would make as much significant contribution. But more importantly, I also felt, look, there are things we wanted to push in Kenya, but they were not moving. My thinking was that, if, how about if we indirectly push them from Rwanda? And indeed, the rest is history. When Rwanda started moving ahead of Kenya with the people like uh, Professor Ndemo, Engineer Rege, and all the rest, Honorable Mutai Kagwe, uh, some of them came also to benchmark, and we saw Kenya also move on. Mm. So sometimes uh, neighbors can help you move in the right direction. But so I think if you're saying this to pulse. Yeah? President Museveni seems to have his pulse on what goes on in Kenya. And of course, <laughs> you're talking metaphorically. He's yes. looking at the, to the West. Right. And that's the East, you know. You, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean the other yeah, way. You don't mean the other way. No, you need to be very I'm, categorical. In, in that regard, I'm with uh, Kwame Nukrumah. You with know, Kwame when Nukrumah. he was asked, will you go East or West, he said, neither. We'll go forward. We'll go forward. <laughs> I think we need to go forward also with this conversation. <laughs> that's, that's <what> you <laughs> yeah, about 1,300 delegates right. and 400 companies participated in the fourth American Chamber of Commerce Summit in Nairobi, if it may go on together.
right? I'm still waiting for, yeah, let me try and read it here from my, from my script, yeah? Uh, that is participated in the forthcoming American Chamber of Commerce Summit in Nairobi. President William Ruto says Kenya is ready for business and means business. Ruto also pledged to narrow the trade deficit between Kenya and the United States as the two countries await the conclusion of a much-awaited strategic trade and investment partnership. The two-day Achim Summit brought together businesses to stimulate commercial opportunities, according to Maxwell Okello, the CEO of Achim Kenya. This year's summit focused on key areas such as the tech space, climate action, and green energy. President Ruto is said also to visit the United States next month, which is actually this month, the first state visit since he was elected. Great talent here. We have a real good human capital. Whatever you want, if you want a good engineer, it doesn't take long to train them. A good financial person, somebody who can different skills, and we are very keen on getting the standard of our education to the right level so that you can access our human capital and use their talent to grow your business. Number two, we are a very tech-savvy country. So technology will help accelerate what you can do in your companies and Kenyans and the Kenyan ecosystem. We are consistently building on uh, making sure that across the country we have fiber optic, we have access to a digital space for e-commerce and for everything in between. Number three, renewable energy is a very big asset. Many of companies who have ECG programs, they would want to decarbonize their enterprises. You have an opportunity to decarbonize some of your investments in other parts of the world by investing in Kenya and using our renewable energy. There is great proposition there. And finally, we are consistently working on improving the business environment. In fact, one leading agency positioned Kenya as the best investment destination in 2024. Maybe possibly that's why you guys are here. And Kenyan exporters will start benefiting from the Kenya-European Union trade deal signed in December last year following Parliament's approval of the pact. The Kenya-EU Economic and Partnership Agreement, EPA, opens up the 27-country market for Kenyan exporters to access duty-free, quarter-free, uh, that is a trade cabinet secretary, Rebecca Miano, and EU ambassador, Henriette Gega, signed the EPA in December 2023 witnessed by President William Ruto and EU uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. The European Parliament had previously ratified the agreement approving the deal for Kenya to export to the EU on a duty-free and quarter-free basis. Trade Investment Ministry noted that while the trade deal opened a wider market for Kenyan exporters in the EU, excluding Britain, it will also open significant opportunities for the EU to trade and invest in Kenya. The agreement secures long-term, duty-free, quarter-free access to the EU market for Kenyan products, thus making the EU a key stimulant for Kenya's economic development and will be open to other East African community partners, states to join through Article 144. That is uh, what the Ministry of noted. Also from uh, the EU commands around $16 trillion, that is a gross domestic product, and has been one of Kenya's largest export destinations globally, absorbing about 21.1% of the country's total exports annually. It is expected that the opening up of the market for quarter-free duty, free access for Kenyan products, will help Kenya narrow the trade gap between the two markets. We shall be looking at that as well. But I wanted also to just discuss uh, the issue of AI uh, that we had the president talking about. And uh, we know also <coughs> Kenyan Cabinet Secretary of Information, Communications and Digital Economy, Elid Owalo, and U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, affirmed their shared priorities for strengthening the digital economy, promoting innovation and increasing digital trade and investment between Kenya and the United States. And uh, Secretary Raimondo 
and Cabinet Secretary Owalo noted the potential benefits of a digital economy. Let's listen in. It's a standalone thematic area, a key result area. And in this regard, there are major interventions that we are introducing into the market or rolling out. We are enhancing the level of our fiber connectivity by 100,000 kilometers, establishing and operationalizing 25,000 Wi-Fi hotspots. In the area of digital skilling, which has aptly been mentioned here, we are setting up a total of 1,450 digital hubs for purposes of digital skilling over the youth, uh, but ultimately, or most importantly, for purposes of pursuit of digital jobs. There are a lot of opportunities on digital platforms today which our youth can exploit. Um, we embarked on this process, just for purposes of illustration, we embarked on this process about a year ago. As we speak, we have trained over 390,000 youth and also created uh, opportunities uh, to the tune of 139,000 digital jobs for the youth. Um, when we came into government, we only had 350 services available on our e-citizen platform. Today we have got a whopping 16,000 892 services which are already domiciled on the EZN platform. The more you digitalize, the more you run the risk of exposure to cyber attacks. But we are saying that we are going to go the full hog and pursue digitalization to a logical conclusion. We will not stop digitalization because of the threat of cyber security. What we need to do is to build a robust uh, risk mitigation framework around our digitalization agenda so that we have an elaborate mechanism of thwarting uh, cyber attacks. Again, in this regard, we are ready and willing to learn from more advanced economies in terms of mitigation against cyber, cyber attacks. We are willing to benchmark with best case practices while customizing to meet our own peculiar uh, situation. All right, and Kenya's national carrier, Kenya Airways, has suspended its flights to Kinshasa, citing the continued detention of its crew by the Democratic Republic of Congo, that is uh, DRC's military, over a controversial consignment of banknotes. In an update on Monday, the airline said the suspension will take effect from Tuesday, pointing out difficulties in supervision and support of its due of its due to the continued detention of KQ employees by the military intelligence and unit in Kinshasa. Kenya Airways is unable to support our flights without personnel effectively. As a result, we reached a difficult decision to suspend flights to Kinshasa effective April 30th, 2024, until we can effectively support this flight, uh, said the carrier's managing director, Alan Kilavuka. In the notice, the move by KQ is set to benefit other airlines serving the Nairobi Kinshasa route, including Ethiopian <coughs> Airlines, Precision Air, um, Air Sky Airlines, and South African Airways. And of course, we want to look at this briefly with our panelists and a raft of other issues as well. Let's just begin with you, Patrick, about because I know Patrick will be leaving us uh, momentarily. Uh, he's got uh, a big appointment, though. I don't want to mention where. Yeah, but I <coughs> always say on Thursday it should be a boards meeting day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we should declare it after Labor Day, uh, right? Let's just start uh, begin from presenting Prof as well because he was in the pipeline. <laughs> yeah, me, I'm just doing it at the end. <laughs> so I know where you're going. Yes, where I'm going. <laughs> yes, yes, but we can begin from Acham, or if you want to talk about also the KQ and this part as well, uh, because there was some tranche of dollars that uh, this is sparking all this debate. <laughs> but it's, this is normal business, according to, you know, the bank. Uh, how they normally, yeah. you ha if you have an inkling, you could tell us what is happening. No, no, I don't know. I want to let me focus on the Amcham and Ocham. the EU deal, yeah? Yes. Right. And also, maybe in a way, going back to the what happened in Somalia as well, eh? mm -hmm. the, 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 the investment right. conference. Yes, in that yes, place. yes. I think I, I am a skeptic in a lot of these things. <laughs> we have a lot of conferences mm -hmm. and we talk a lot. And if you go back a year, two years later, yeah. and look at the impact of those promises at that point in time, mm -hmm. zero <coughs> or minimal completely. <laughs> yeah? Look at Agoa, which has been in, the, in place now for I don't know how many years, almost 15 years now? More. Mm -hmm. More. Kenya is only using maybe about 20 items out of 6,700 potential lines of export to the U.S., mm -hmm. We are signing an EPA with the EU. Mm -hmm. How many 
of us are really going to go to the EU with that EPA. So once we sign them, we open, it's, it's normally a two-way traffic. It's not just one way. Mm -hmm. And when you sign them for a large number of goods, it means that initially what is going to happen is you're going to get flow into Kenya. And then you have everybody up in arms, and then you start putting taxes and everything else. Much against that, then you go into other negotiations again to sort of try and sort of, um, you know, panel beat that thing to suit the real circumstances. Yeah? So look at Amcham as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, I, 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 I love Amcham, they're good people. Last year, there was a major deal that was signed. Right? There was, I think, uh, there was a vaccine company that was supposed to be setting up in Kenya. And this mm -hmm. was signed, inked, everything else. It's one year down the line. <coughs> was it mentioned during that Amcham meeting? I wasn't there. But I think it was zipped completely. Mm -hmm. I think Moderna was supposed to be coming to Kenya. Where are they? Is there something that is not happening in our country that all these deals that we sign and talk about do not actually re result in a boom that we're expecting from those things, mm -hmm. right? So I, you know, I love all this, you know, all this stuff, you know, um, you, we go and we sign agreements, EPAs, you name it, the works. But are we ready as a country to exploit those deals? And are we really <coughs> an investment-friendly destination? I know a lot of companies that have very excitedly signed agreements to come and invest in different parts of the country, with county governments, with the national government, depending on what it is. And when it now push comes to shove, and they come to say, now we want this done, you want that done, you want that done, you want that done, you find a whole bunch of people now sitting there waiting with briefcases to fill. And your investors go away because of that. So I think let's be real as Kenya. Let's be real. We have a country that has got a lot of opportunities. We have a country where the rules and regulations and everything else that we have are very much investor friendly. If you look at the ease of doing business, right. we went from being about 130 to about 50, purely because of the having the right regulations and the right processes in place, which meant that we were investor uh, friendly on paper. Going from 50 pass, from number 50 mm -hmm. to number 10 mm -hmm. will be by the implementation of those processes. And that has stalled completely because now when it comes to people and convincing people it should be done, we are stuck. Mm -hmm. And so the, the two items we spoke about, you know, um, the, the, the EU, the EPA deal, and also the Amcham conference that has happened, and a lot of conferences that happen in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got tourism, we've got this and the other and everything else. Two, three years down the line, we see no action. What is it? that we can do as a country to transform those opportunities into reality mm -hmm. and start bringing the jobs that our president so <coughs> passionately talks about. Mm -hmm. Something must change for that to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, in this KQ, and I think there's a, it's, it's a <laughs> 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 the issue of transporting stuff. Um, you know, you can transport gold from Kenya like uh, our good friend did many years ago. That's interesting. Right? Interesting. You mentioned gold first. <laughs> yes. Let me accomplish. It doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> the, the gold came from the same country when it was coming here and, and being sold as you know, gold produced in Kenya at that time. You know, the scam that happened there. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, th there is something that, you know, for every smoke, uh, you know, every smoke there, I mean, you know, there, there must be a fire down there somewhere. So there is something that is not being said. And unfortunately, some people who are innocently part of this whole thing have now been nabbed. It could be Kenya Airways, it could be the staff of Kenya Airways who have been nabbed as a result of some people doing some, some nefarious activity down there. And until the, until the truth comes out, really, yeah, um, I think this grandstanding at the government level mm -hmm. is all around, you know, it's our airline. But let's understand what it is below that that, that this country right. was, trying to, was trying to stop. Mm -hmm. And it may be an embarrassment from, for both countries what was actually about to happen. And therefore, they'll never come out to light. And they'll talk and eventually they'll say, okay, fine, I think we've stopped it for long enough. We know what is happening. Now you can resume. Mm -hmm. And then you'll resume very quickly. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, I think <coughs> if it's taken so long before the outcome is really known, it means that it's an embarrassment that is going to happen to both countries that is they're still negotiating how to, 
how to sanitize the announcement of what it is that, that, that actually went on. It did. And, and barely yeah. six months, of course, uh, we're still on another uh, Kenya DRC spot, uh, diplomatic stuff, yeah, I mean, right. stuff that we have right now. Uh, <coughs> We need we need to make sure that at least there's a happy medium. And we were sending somebody there who doesn't know what's GDP. <laughs> <laughs> no, he had an idea. He had an idea. At least he had an idea. Yeah, the There has to be population. Yeah. There has to be population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you have an idea, we excuse you. <laughs> I, I don't want us to lose the digitalness that uh, the minister, the armchair, and all talked about. If you yeah. allow me. Mm -hmm. Despite what Kotu may have done yesterday or the years before, one commendable thing is that yesterday's theme was uh, digital work. I think the fact that even we've come of age where even Kotu and Francis Atwili are talking about technology is quite commendable. Contrast this debate 30 years back when we had uh, former late President Moi. I remember I think sometime around 96 or thereabout while addressing a rally in Nakuru, the president said Kenya does not need computers because they're going to take away jobs in a public rally. So we have come full circle 30 years later. So to that extent, it's commendable what Kenya Kwanza and Kotu and all FKE focusing on digital and uh, technology. And part of this was also very evident during the American Chamber Summit. Allow me to compliment the CEO, Maxwell, Okelo, as well as Ambassador Meg. In fact, I remember the MC did, no, I think it was chair of the AMCHAM board, called her the Kenya's ambassador to the US and added officially the American ambassador to Kenya. I think we've, uh, I mean, to be fair to Ambassador Meg, she has if been a good, uh, a good, a very good ally to Kenya in terms of promoting. Ambassador, let's be clear, that is what she is, not yeah, an ally. Yeah, she good. so she, she has yeah, done. We define way, the lines. Uh. Yeah, that's her. <laughs> she, she has done way beyond other ambassadors in terms of promoting Kenya. I like her topic usually is why Africa, why Kenya, and uh, yeah. so she does a good job. But coming back to Amcham, I, I may not give it a gloomy picture as Patrick is doing. From Amcham last year, I think there are some pluses. One of the things that was signed was BT Cotton. I remember when my governor, Homer Bay governor, was, had the opportunity to talk at this event. She did indicate, whereas I don't have the exact figures, but the production of cotton in the past one year has grown almost 10 times. So there is some achievement. But I fully agree with uh, Patrick in terms of much more would be done it, it looks like um, there are many suitors for Kenya willing to do business, and uh, the U.S. seems to be one of them. In fact, one of my takeaways from the Amcham Summit was uh, the drifting focus. Even the USAID, I was, I was, I was very, uh, I was delighted to note, is even though they continue, will continue to support development, there is a focus now also onto business with a private sector arm. How do we promote trade and investment? So Kenyans must, in my view, be prepared to grab the opportunities. There could be no better time. And the priorities that were being mentioned, green energy, tech, the only thing I have, even though I appreciate the Honorable CS talking about fiber and all, I think if we try to use fiber to address last mile, uh, then there is something we are missing because fiber mm. is not going to go to my rural home or your parents' rural home. It's got to be a mix. Although he talks about hotspots, mm. I think it's got to be a mix. And there are technologies that would make that happen. So my premise is uh, the ball with, um, in fact, um, it wasn't only the government delegations, and, but the private sector, but even government delegation. President Biden did form a presidential executive council. I think the co-chair was here. A very strong team looking at how do we promote Africa, U.S., trade and particularly US Kenya trade there could be no better time for Kenyan businesses to be on the table to take advantage lastly I may just mention this is part of why as Kenya Diaspora Alliance and Africa Diaspora Alliance with the term in terms of the deal room I was privileged about two weeks ago to give a lecture at the University of Nairobi uh, in collaboration with the Royal Academy of Engineering British 
And I was pleasantly surprised, the African prize, they have about 150 prize winners. Among them, 35 very outstanding young people, talented with good innovations and enterprises, looking for capital. And yet, when we had the deal room, we have Bra Belgian dollar millionaires, uh, French, American, and so on, saying, look, we're looking for good projects. How do we match them with curated businesses? So there's a good opportunity. Let's get more of our private sector on the table to grab the opportunity. Right. Bilo, I, I, I know Patrick wants to leave, so I wanted just to grow up, throw a bombshell before we come to you, Bilo. Uh, because I saw this on uh, Business Daily, that uh, U.S. funds loses four-year tax battle from uh, Java House. <coughs> You know, Patrick is the chair of Java House. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Patrick, I know this is coming from the, from the left side. As maybe it would be good for you to talk about this uh, emerging capital of Partners good Kenya. <laughs> let him go with a good mood. <laughs> I let him go with a good mood. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but he cannot be on this panel, and I know he's I the chair. Uh, one, yeah. And, uh, and we let this just go off that. So we wanted to know what is, what is happening here. I think in this particular case, there is a very interesting technical point in tax. When you are a, a fund, you normally get funds from somewhere else, and you come in and you invest in, in, a, in, in an entity in Kenya. So when you've invested, and, you know, and normally the investment takes five to seven years to mature, and then you sell it on to another, another organization or another <laughs> fund and so forth. So at the point where you are selling to another fund. And that fund to fund um, change is happening elsewhere. It's not happening here. Mm -hmm. So if fund A in the US sells to fund B in Germany mm -hmm. and they take over here, is that transaction supposed to be taxed in Kenya? Mm -hmm. If you are selling it fund A to fund B in Kenya, so if I was selling it to, you know, to, um, uh, to Shem here, I'm resident and domiciled in Kenya. But if the fund is resident and domiciled elsewhere, mm. and they do the sale from fund to fund in a, in, in a foreign country, is it liable to tax in Kenya? Mm -hmm. That is what this is all about. I mean, and I think it's very much a technical discussion um, where, you know, where is the domicile of this transaction and the tax supposed to be there? And I think this has been going on for some time. Mm -hmm. We are, I think, between ECP and KRA in terms of trying to understand where it is. And I think KRA have come down and said it has to be paid, that transaction tax, mm -hmm. and uh, withholding tax, whatever it is that has to happen, has to be paid in Kenya because you're buying a Kenyan entity. Irrespective of where that transaction is taking place, you're transacting a Kenyan entity. So therefore, we must pay in tax country. in Kenya mm -hmm. because you're going to transfer the ownership in Kenya. So that is really what is happening there, and it's, it's setting a precedent in terms of how um, private equity coming into Kenya has to set themselves up in order to not lose a lot of money um, in terms of that transaction in taxes that could be inflated beyond what they're used to in other countries. I think that's, that's what you're seeing But, but I think as it goes, there's a, there's a very strong point he raised, and uh, I think I hear shame. You raise something important, ease of doing business. That's what will bring an investor. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to go to an economy which is predictable. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to look at country the taxation, right. the cost of doing business sure. power. Mm -hmm. And at all this, you hear this and it's rhetoric. I go to NATO. NATO. Nothing. No action, talk only. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it. That's it actually. In, in the sense that. Okay. Uh, I, I think I need to release Patrick. Well, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Nothing. No mm -hmm. action. This is NATO. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Not Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh -huh. So uh, this is your, you're calling it to? No, no action. No action. Talk, talk only. only. No action. Talk, talk only. only. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Patrick. <laughs> this is law. This is law. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Even as we take a short break. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, well, whatever you mean, thank you so much for that. We're going to take a short break. You're watching Sokoto. When you circle back, of course, we shall hear from Bill Okero uh, on uh, a raft of issues as well. If you want to comment on, on this uh, Java issue as well, you, you can comment on it, on it on behalf of uh, or in absentia of a chair of Java House. This is uh, Engineer Patrick Obath, who is also the chair of Kepsa Foundation. We take a short break.